Uh, are you getting everybody? So we are now ready for the guest lecture by Vincent uh, Muller, Professor Vincent Muller from, uh, uh, actually connecting from Oxford. He, has, uh, he is from the University of Oxford and the Anatolia College in Greece. And uh, you, if you see the title of the presentation, you, you should think uh, you, that uh, it could be interesting. At least uh, it, it seems uh, uh, willing to uh, challenge conventional uh, wisdom. With, uh, actually, uh, Vincent is a philosopher working about topics related to AI, including ethics. Vincent. Okay, thank you, Fabio. Uh, so, thank you, Fabio. Thanks for inviting me. Um, yeah, as you can see, the name underneath the screen is wrong. And that's just the name under which I registered the software. So my name is Vincent, as uh, Fabio said. So um, when Fabio invited me, I said to him that I have this uh, topic I'm working on at the moment, and I would be happy to talk about that, which is, I think, loosely related to what we're usually doing in the Shanghai lectures. But I think it's important that roboticists uh, think about the ethical concerns of their work. And one of the... Um, well, let's say elephants in the room that people don't usually talk about is the military use of robots. So even if you're not doing explicitly military research, uh, a lot of your work will be used by the military, uh, and sometimes you're even funded by the military directly or indirectly. So that's why I thought it might be good to talk about this. Um, so I think you can, you can see the first slide already, is that right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. Um, so this is th this work is something that I'm doing together with Tom Simpson, um, and uh, the context is that uh, there is a very big uh, discussion about autonomous lethal robots, and uh, everybody thinks it's a terrible idea. And uh, we've been trying to make ourselves some friends by saying that maybe it's a good idea. Um, and one of the interesting backgrounds of this is that I am a conscientious objector to the military service. I did not go. And Tom uh, was a, an officer in the British Army. So we have different backgrounds in that respect, too. Um, here, here's a, just an indication of what's going on. Um, the uh, US Department of Defense has published this uh, document called the Unmanned Systems Integrated Roadmap. Um, of course, it's sexist terminology they're using there, but they're talking about no humans in there. Um, and they're thinking, as you can see in the image, of systems that fly underwater, uh, on the water, and so on. And uh, in that roadmap, they, they say what they're planning to do in the next 25 years. Uh, and they uh, complain that they don't get enough money uh, for doing all these important things because they can only spend $5 billion per year. Uh, so that gigantic amount of money is something that seems very short to them. And that's just the amount of money that the Department of Defense is spending on it directly. So uh, DARPA, uh, that has a $3, million, uh, $3 billion budget, also contributes substantially to this work. So there's probably another billion or so somewhere there. Um, um, the weapons that we're talking about here, we, we prefer, or it's now current, to use the term uh, lethal autonomous weapons. So they're weapons that are used in war, that's lethal, and they are in some sense of the word autonomous. Uh, that is, they don't have a human in the loop in the decision to uh, select a target and attack a target, or as the military talk is, engage a target. Um, so what's happening in this area? Well, the thing that most people, of course, will know about is the first bullet point there is that the, the Pakistani drone war. Um, notice it's already going on for 10 years. It's a very long time. I was surprised when I found out about this. Uh, the numbers there about the deaths, two to three and a half thousand are from Wikipedia, um, which includes a fairly large number of civilians, um, in other words, innocent people. And uh, these systems are remote controlled, so they're not autonomous. Somebody controls them from a very long distance, usually half the way across the, the globe. Um, so 
the autonomous systems obviously something that's coming up. There is some work in this direction that's already, some stuff that's already working. So uh, on the sea, for example, there are systems like the phalanx system that automatically detect uh, attacks to a ship. So um, oncoming missiles, oncoming aircraft, and so on. And these systems have to be very, very fast. Uh, so there is just quite simply not the time to think whether the commander now wants to press the button to attack the oncoming missile, but you set it and then it attacks the missile, it det detects it and attacks it uh, automatically. Um, on, um, on the seas, there's also a new development this year, the uh, Navy, US Navy uh, demonstrated a system of swarm boats that will go around larger ships and protect them from the attacks by smaller ships, like in the USS Cole case. Um, currently, these are not autonomous, but it's very clear that they're just holding back on that. They could just turn the switch and then they would be autonomously also attacking. Um, on land, there have been systems to protect tanks from uh, rockets for quite a long time. So the, US, the Soviets were the first ones to develop those in the Afghan wars. Um, a, new, a recent one is the uh, active, be, active vehicle protection system in the, from Deal, a German company, um, which reacts well below 400 milliseconds. So it's fairly fast, which means again there is no time to ask anybody, and there isn't any time because the rocket is coming on. So you have to decide whether you want to shoot at it or not. Um, and uh, more sophisticated developments are the combat drones, so there actually are drones now that are autonomous, uh, not remote controlled, so the Taramis drone and the uh, US uh, carrier launch surveillance and strike drone, they can actually take off, the latter can take off an aircraft carrier uh, autonomously and do a surveillance mission, but it can also attack uh, ground and aircraft. It's just currently not doing that, but again, it's a matter of a relatively short time and political decision to actually have this happening. Um, and a little bit of advertisement, uh, myself and Nick Bostrom, we did a little uh, survey to find out when um, AI experts think that, that we will have uh, high level machine intelligence, so basically human level abilities and the uh, average the average estimate for the 50% probability point, that is not the point when it's happening, but the point when the probability goes over 50%, was between 2014 and 50. So between now and that time and a little bit later, we will pretty clearly have the technical ability to, to have these autonomous weapons. So it's about time that we start thinking about them. Here is a sort of popular impression of how this might look. Uh, the Economist is always uh, quite close to the pulse of this, but notice the Economist is being a bit nice. There are no killers in that picture. They're all um, doing this. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not telling Nathan to change the slides. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, yes. Okay, I'm changing the slides. Now, next one. Um, so the, the plan is that, that we will say, uh, talk a little bit about the problem of responsibility. We'll talk about the problem of humanitarian law so the, the law of war, uh, and see what, whether these indicate that we shouldn't have these kind of weapons, and then we'll do what philosophers call a utility calculation and try to figure out whether they make war less bad or more bad and less likely and more likely. And this, we think anyway, um, settles the matter pretty much, if you can do all these things together. Uh, next. Um, one thing that happens in this kind of debate, and, and we should, that's the thing we're trying to avoid, is that people use these simple sort of slogans. They, they say, for example, make love, not war, which is nice and, and, and probably good, but um, this isn't what's happening, and it's not actually what we do as a society as well. I mean, all the countries that are represented in this lecture have armies. Uh, that is, they spend a lot of their public money everybody's taxpayer money on having some kind of military institution. So the question that we're asking ourselves here is not whether that is the right or the wrong thing to do. We just take that as a fact that that is what actually happens. 
pretty much everywhere. Um, so the slogan, Stop Killer Robot, which is the next slogan there, which is an actual slogan, there's an actual campaign for that, uh, which is very successful too, is just a slogan. It sounds good, right? Stopping killers is good. Uh, but you do want to find out whether uh, this is really a good idea or not. Uh, lots of things which are going around there are not um, solving these problems. So some people sort of on the on the right-hand side, so the National Rifle Association, for example, they say things like guns don't kill people, people kill people. It's not really the guns that do the d damage. Better weapons are better. You can't stop the progress anyway, right? So they're just avoiding the discussion as well. Um, some people go to the other extreme and say autonomous weapons are ethical agents or patients, which I think is wrong, but I'll talk about this in a sec second. So they are responsible for their actions. Uh, and one important aspect of the debate is that drones are used for extrajudicial killings. So the United uh, States are using drones for killing people whom they decide are terrorists. So this is clearly extrajudicial, right? There's no legal procedure which decides that this person deserves the death penalty. They just go somewhere after some procedure, which we don't know what it is, and decide that that person should be killed. So drones are used for that, and that's a, a problem. Uh, next. So I've already said the official line at the moment is that we're developing all these weapons. We're not, we're not making them autonomous. So the Department of Defense has, has uh, the U.S. Department of Defense has uh, some guidelines on these things. And they say, for example, current armed unmanned systems deploy lethal force only in a fully human operated context for engagement decisions. Right? So they think, for example, that this ship defense system satisfies that requirement because it's a human that sets the system, sets the parameters, and then says system on, and then the human is the person responsible for that action. Um, and the current directive, and that's the second bullet point there, says that autonomous weapons shall be designed to allow commanders and operators to exercise appropriate levels of human judgment over the use of force. So this is the current directive. It's very new, as you can tell, or relatively new. And uh, of course, this is a directive. So any kind of you know, political change can change that if they want. And they can also subvert it. Right? Of course, there are directives which says we don't torture, and that's just subverted. It's not changed. Um, so the interesting question is, should they change this, or should they not change that, and should the, these systems be banned? Next. Um, so the relevant, uh, one relevant concern here is the humanitarian law. That is the law of war as set down in the Geneva Conventions. It's a fairly complex story. Um, uh, much of this is conventional. Um, that is not actually agreed on. But anyway, the, the two important principles involved there are the principle of distinction and of proportionality. So in order to uh, carry out military action in a legal way, uh, that is not as a war crime, you have to distinguish between combatants and civilians. These are the terms that people use there, right? So uh, you cannot, for example, go into some kind of mountain village uh, and decide that these people somehow, you think, in some case, may have supported um, the uh, Guerrilla, and therefore just kill everybody in the village, right? Like the Nazis did in Greece, for example. Uh, that uh, would be violating the principle of distinction, right? So um, this means if you have a an automated system, it has to be able to distinguish what is a combatant, what's a what's a civilian. If you're looking at a human, a soldier. It has to be able to do that for, for example, if it wants to attack a ship, it should know whether that's a warship or a civilian ship, or whether it is a hospital ship, in which case it, again, should not be attacking it. Same for aircraft and so on, right? But you remember the recent story about uh, the Ukraine, where the civilian aircraft was shot down. That's a violation of this role. Um, and uh, the principle of proportionality is, is similar, but it's, it's more complicated. It, it says somehow the, lo the damage that you do to civilian life and property and so on should be proportional to the military aims that you're pursuing. So 
uh, if you're bombarding some place, for example, for the military purpose that you have, um, then of course, in very many cases, civilians will get killed. You cannot avoid that in many cases. So, but the damage that you do to them should be proportional to the military aims that you have. So that's why, for example, the uh, Allied bombardment of Dresden uh, was a war crime because it violated this principle. There was no military target there, uh, which is why lots of people had, had gone there exactly. And the damage was not proportional to the military aim, which was almost nil. Okay, so if we want to use uh, uh, lethal autonomous weapons, they have to obey by these principles. Some people say that means that we can't use them. That means we should ban them because the current robots, so Noel Sharkey, for example, is saying that. Current robots, as we all know, cannot do this sufficiently well. In particular, they cannot uh, decide on proportionality. Um, we think that this is not a particularly good argument. First of all, it only says that this is currently difficult. Uh, and yes, obviously, if you have a weapon that would not make that distinction, for example, then you should not use it, or using it would be a war crime. So that's, that's pretty clear. Um, on the other hand, it's very clear that principal distinction, for example, can be uh, obtained. So there is, it is possible to distinguish tanks from, from cars. Uh, and attack the tanks, and it's probably possible to, or it's certainly possible to distinguish your own tanks from the enemy's tanks. Uh, and of course, no military commander would use this thing if it wouldn't be able to do that, make that distinction. Um, so, it seems that uh, there is at least hope that these things can be uh, resolved. And in any case, this is not a principled argument why these kind of things, the laws, should not be used. These these kind of weapons should not be used. Um, this is, however, something that's, sorry, that's next slide, that the United Nations discuss uh, intensely. So uh, the United Nations have, have made a resolution that's in 2013, which says that, um, for example, here, to ensure that any measures taken or means employed to counter terrorism, including the use of remotely piloted aircraft, comply with their obligations under international law you know whom, whom that is directed against, right? And um, they stress the urgent and imperative need to seek agreement among member states on legal questions pertaining to remotely piloted aircraft operations. So that's exactly the fine print, so to speak, where this discussion is taking place, and that's, I think, important. Um, there is a discussion taking place now at the United Nations Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, that's a, a subset of the United Nations, uh, where all the states and various other people are um, giving their views, and they're discussing a ban of killer robots. This is a current discussion. It's an important discussion taking place right now. Uh, we will have the first resolution next week. So this is the current debate we are trying to contribute to. And it's, you know, it's a real policy debate. We have to decide what we want to do now. Next. Um, next. So the, um, the responsibility problem. Uh, some people have said there is a problem with responsibility with these kind of systems. So here's a quote from Mr. Sparrow, uh, Rob Sparrow, who writes on these things. He says, imagine that you have an airborne autonomous weapon system um, that deliberately bombs a column of enemy soldiers who have clearly indicated their desire to surrender. Okay, so if they have, desired, have indicated this desire, then it's a war crime to, to deliberately attack them. And he says, Let's stipulate this was not a mistake. The system had reasons for what it did, but they were not, of course, justifying reasons. Um, if a human had been doing this, then we, should, we would convict him of a war crime. But whom sh should we try for the war crime in such a case? Who's responsible? And he says, if there's nobody responsible, then we shouldn't be using those systems. If responsibility just sort of dissolves, then clearly uh, that would be a huge moral problem because we want, if we have a crime, we want to have a person responsible for the crime that whom we can punish for that crime. Um, so it's sort of a, a, a gap argument. He says that there is a gap, the responsibility gap argument. Sorry, that's the next slide. Um, and he's, he, set his, he sets a condition which says that 
A war is fought justly only if for each killing there's an individual who may properly be held responsible for it. Right? So he thinks in the chain of command there has to be a specific individual who can say, you gave the command and then this person transferred it and this person carried it out and we know therefore you are the one responsible for that. Um, we think that that's probably not uh, not a very good idea to make it such an extremely accurate uh, condition. So there has to be somebody properly held responsible. Because in civil life, uh, life and death decisions have a tolerance and we expect only what's called due care. So imagine that you're building a bridge. Um, now you have people who are involved in whether that bridge is dangerous or not. You have engineers, you have workers who built the bridge, uh, you have public inspectors that check whether the bridge is according to regulations. We have users that go on the bridge with vehicles that have certain weight, for example, and so on. So, um, we have some regulations which say that if the bridge is supposed to be uh, good enough for, you know, two lanes with cars not weighing over 10 tons each or something like that and traveling not at speeds not over 80 kilometers an hour uh, on a small bridge, then we would say that the engineer then has to say, okay, if I want to build a bridge like that, then here is the state of the art that makes the bridge satisfy these requirements and um, what happens if the bridge collapses anyway? Well, now we can check what happened. Well, maybe somebody went onto the bridge with a huge truck way over the uh, weight limit. In that case, they are responsible. Um, maybe the engineer didn't design the bridge properly, in which case they're responsible. Maybe the uh, construction company used uh, uh, cheap material in order to make it and therefore the bridge wasn't as stable as it was supposed to be. Uh, so they're responsible. Maybe the inspector didn't inspect the bridge regularly and properly over the years, so maybe they're responsible. But it is possible that we find that everybody exercised due care and the bridge still collapses. So for example, something happens that nobody has thought of. So a, an earthquake happens that was just too big for this particular bridge and nobody expected it. Sort of a, um, yeah, this, this kind of un, unexpected event. So we, we do say that there is responsibility of the individual people in that chain, the engineer, the users, and so on. But we don't say that if everybody is doing their, their job properly, then the bridge cannot possibly collapse. We're not making bridges like that. We, make, we say the probability of the bridge collapses is then so low that we say, okay, we're gonna build it this way. And building it to a much, much higher standard, which would be possible, would be much, much more expensive, but we, we're not gonna do that. We think it's okay if we have a certain safety uh, tolerance and that's all right. So that is, I think, what we suggest that, that should happen in this case, too. Uh, next. Um, so this is, there is a, there's a slightly more detailed philosophical point, and we're writing a, a separate paper on that. Um, what happens if you have a, a system that chooses some ends and reasons, so it has near, nearly full autonomy, um, so we're thinking of, for example, what happens if you have systems that are similar to using an animal or a child soldier, right? That, of course, actually exists. Um, so when would that be responsible? And we think that perhaps we should, in this case, have a slightly tougher demands if you're talking about illegitimate killing. So not just somebody getting killed as a result of the bridge being collapsing, for example, but somebody being killed in the sense of murdered in that case we should have somebody who is responsible. So if it's not the child, uh, the child soldier, then it has to be the commander of the child soldier, something like that. Uh, there's some nitty gritty there on that. So um, next slide, uh, being responsible and being held responsible. If you've ever looked at what happens with war crimes, 
it, it, it's really, really depressing. Uh, not only are war crimes extremely common, uh, there is an enormous amount of evidence for, for terrible things that happen, even with very well organized armies in the Iraq wars, the recent Iraq wars, for example. Um, but it's also the case that it's almost impossible to convict anybody of a war crime. It's, it's very, very hard to find who's actually responsible, um, nail them, get them, get them to a court. Uh, uh, the countries involved are very reluctant to convict anybody and so on. It's very, very difficult. Usually, war crimes go unpunished. Um, so for this nasty situation, perhaps legal autonomous weapons could be a little improvement because they do produce digital records. So it might actually be easier if you use an autonomous weapon to say who pressed the button, when, and what was attacked, and was that a war crime? So I think, I think this might be an advantage. Um, a second point on this slide is that we have to regulate the manufacturers, uh, just like the bridge has to be regulated, we think the manufacturers of weapons should be regulated too. Um, and it has to be particularly tight because there's a difference between the weapon and the, and the bridge. If I go on the bridge, I sort of accept there is a minimal risk of going over that bridge because I do want to get across the river, say, right? Um, so, and maybe I even agree that, that it's correct the way the bridges are built so that they're not uh, that they could collapse in a hundred years as opposed to being collapsing in a thousand years, say, statistically. Um, if, on the other hand, I'm the victim of some kind of attack of an autonomous weapon, I have not agreed to any of these things. Um, I'm just the victim, uh, and therefore the tolerance should be much, much tighter, uh, it seems to us, uh, for people getting killed who are uh, not the targets. Okay. Um, so, next slide, utility calculations. So we think there's no particular problem with the, with the legal situation and there's no particular problem with responsibility. Um, the responsibility still rests with the humans who use the weapons. Um, so the other thing that philosophers usually look at, so it's, it's principles, considerations, values, and it's the outcomes. So if we were to use these things, would that actually re result in some morally bad outcome? Um, and which should, should we avoid it in that way? Uh, we think there are two considerations here. One is, would it make wars bad, even worse, or slightly less bad? So that's one consideration. So in the war, would they make the wars be better or worse? And the other consideration is, would they make the probability of, ha of a war even happening higher or lower? Okay, so here's the first part, making wars less bad or worse. Now, wars are, are really, really bad. I mean, they, they involve combatants who are killed, wounded, traumatized, and so on. Uh, and that is important to realize. It's the combatants uh, do suffer uh, enormously in the wars, and they don't just suffer during the war. Uh, then, of course, there are the non-combatants, the civilians, who also get killed, wounded, and traumatized, and so on. Then there is uh, the infrastructure, weaponry, and so on that gets destroyed. There is the civilian material that gets destroyed, the cultural heritage that, that gets destroyed. So that's happening in Iraq, for example, at a big scale now. Um, there is war crimes being committed and perhaps persecuted. Future generations are, get, are getting damaged. So I am damaged by the fact that uh, Germany is a lot more ugly than it used to be because of uh, World War II. And then there are political or other aims which are relevant for the utility. So, for example, freedom, right? So World War II had its merits in the sense that uh, the Nazis didn't uh, govern all of Europe. So in all these considerations, you can sort of look at that and see, would, would it make any difference if we had autonomous weapons versus non-autonomous ones? Um, it seems that the overall outcome would likely be positive, so it looks like we will certainly we will have less combatants who are killed or wounded and so on. Um, we will we will have slightly higher accuracy, so perhaps we will have less non-combatants also being killed and less things destroyed that we want to be destroyed. We'll have more persecution war crimes, so perhaps we'll avoid more of the war crimes. 
or that would be good for future generations. So it looks like um, wars will slightly will look slightly better, right? Again, they're they're really really bad, but you know, not quite as bad uh, with the help of these or with with these weapons in them. Um, next slide is a picture on that one. Um, now, of course, the motivation for doing these things is this in this comic here. Um, is one of the things it's easier to kill someone when you're far away and you're you don't see where they are and there's no danger for you right so the, uh, the CIA drone operator sitting in Langley and sort of having a joystick like a video game they're definitely a lot more reluctant to kill somebody than if they had to you know use a club and, and bash them over the head um, so this leads to the problem of of the next slide, utility calculations two, the probability of wars. Um, so do they make wars more or less likely? Well, if the wars are less bad for us, so for one side of the war, then that one side is, is more likely to go to war. So it's very clear, for example, that the United States drone war has that structure, right? There are no drones sent from Pakistan to the United States and killing people in Kansas. So that fact makes it a lot easier for the US president to decide to go on with this war. Um, so that is clearly the case, generally speaking, if you're having a, uh, uh, if you have a significant military uh, your power is much, much higher than that of your opponent, then you're much, much more likely to go to war. Um, so is there a difference to remote controlled weapons, however, with this case? I think not. I mean, it looks like it doesn't matter for the political decision whether the weapons are remote controlled or autonomous. What matters is that nobody, none of our boys gets killed. That's what matters. Um, so, uh, some people, so Ronald Arkin, for example, have suggested that all this discussion is really just a matter of an arms race that's currently going on. So if you think about um, Goliath and David, well, Goliath was, was a huge warrior and a threatening uh, sight, and David uh, attacked him from a distance, right, by throwing a, a stone. So. Um, that was uh, something that Goliath obviously thought was unfair and uh, he didn't really saw, see that coming. So um, that's a matter of, a, of an arms race. Now the other guys on Goliath's side will find out that these slings are really good weapons on a distance and they'll have some slingers also. Not Goliath, he's not the right person for that. But um, so. So these things sort of one per, one set goes up and develops a weapon, and then the other one comes back again, and so on. So you can see what happens if Al Qaeda will start having uh, remote control drones, right? Uh, well, they, of course they'll have trouble actually getting them into the United States, but if that if they could, then the whole thing would be sort of balanced again. That's why the U U.S. will not use these kind of drones against Russia, say, because Russia has them too, and it wouldn't uh, be a good idea to do that. So it looks like that the, it does increase the probability of wars, but only for a short period of time until the other ones have caught up. And, and so it, it looks like there, it doesn't really make a huge difference. But there is a possibility that it makes a difference. Uh, I think particularly on point B that it is uh, the military action short of wars. So it's, it's much more likely that you can sort of have smaller strikes, something that's going on for quite some time, a little bit here, a little bit there, as opposed to an all-out war. Um, so, and, and particularly, as I said, in asymmetric situations, right? Not Russia versus the United States, but the United States versus what they call Al-Qaeda, whatever that is exactly. Okay, next and last slide. Um, so the, the position that we, we came to is that we think that killer robots don't pose a particularly new challenge to humanitarian law. So they pose a challenge, but they're not, not a new one. Um, B, kill robots uh, pose no new issue of responsibility. So we still have humans that are responsible. Even if the weapons are more sophisticated, you are still responsible for the weapons. So just like 
Goliath was responsible for what his sword does, so uh, David was responsible for what his stone does, uh, and the same will happen with the autonomous uh, drones or other autonomous weapons. Um, the point C is that the overall consequences of having killer robots in war are likely positive, that is, slightly less bad wars, and the negative consequences seem to be the same as those of con remote controlled weapons, whom, which we already have. So maybe we should ban those as well. That's another discussion, but it looks like it's just part of the usual sort of arms race situation. So maybe we're just looking at uh, nothing new here, uh, really. Uh, so thank you. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. Um, I usually have that slide at the end, but maybe in this case I should add a little uh, gun to the left-hand side. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay. Okay. So I think we, we so we have time for question or comments. Uh, I mean, it's uh, just a, a preliminary comment is that uh, it's not loosely coupled to what we are discussing here because. I think we, we need to be conscious uh, of the consequence of the research that we are developing, not on research and application that we are developing. So the ethical discussion is at the center of robotics and AI, I think. So questions? I thought that someone uh, could receive some of uh, these ideas uh, as, um, as controversial, but uh, it seems uh, that everybody agrees. So are you okay with an army of drones? Maybe walking drones, you know, you maybe you maybe remember Star Wars, no? So you... It seems that nobody I have, is. Uh, a question from from Plymouth. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you for thank you for your talk. Uh, very very interesting. Um, so I had a, you were talking a little bit about the arms race, the possibility of an arms race occurring. Um, mm -hmm. And I remember the um, I think it was Norbert Wiener that was um, a bit critical about the for example the Manhattan Project. You know, 140,000 people or something working for for something years to develop these, these weapons of mass destruction. And then the argument for doing it was that the other part shouldn't, uh, well, you should, you, you should kind of stay ahead of the other, uh, your opponent. But his argument was that, um, well, it, I mean, if you now take the genie out of the bottle, um, you can't put it back in, and the other persons will just basically copy what you've done, and you'll be back in this, uh, at square one after a couple of years. Is that something you see happening here as well, or is, is that an argument at all? I have, tr so thank you for that point. That, that is an important point. I, I've tried not to use that argument, right? So I, I, I have not said, uh, well, these are nasty things, but we should use them anyway, because the other ones, the other guys are going to use them, right? So, which is essentially an argument along the lines of the, you can't stop the progress, progress in scare quotes in this case, right? This, the progress of the, the technological progress. Um, we know, in a sense, that that's false. You can stop the technological progress on some lines. So we have stopped progress on uh, chemical weapons, for example, right? We have stopped, uh, we have banned anti-personnel mines. Uh, so so anti-personnel mines are an interesting point here. So the, why did we ban them? Well, the point is that, that these mines stay in the ground even after wars, and then they, they kill whoever steps on the mine, right? So it's just like some, some kid goes to school, takes the wrong path, and they get killed. But even in the war, they kill whoever steps on the mine. So they do not satisfy the description, the, the principle of discrimination. Um, so uh, that's why they're, they're, there's another reason is that the military use is moderate, right? So. So that's why it was possible politically to pressure for that and say, okay, well, maybe we should ban those weapons. And, and, and it, they're pretty much banned now by most countries involved. Um, so I, I don't think I want to take that line. Uh, I, I think specifically that 
what we should do, and I think that the nuclear weapons example is exactly the point, the example in point, we should, we should think, do we want those weapons, right? And if we don't want them, then we should make a political decision to ban them. And could this be done? I, I think it could be done. It, it's, uh, it's very hard um, to, uh, to actually do this in practice. Um, I think the major difficulty in this case is the, the fine line between the more or less autonomous system. Right? If, you, if something is a nuclear bomb, it's a nuclear bomb. It's not a conventional bomb. It at least has some uranium in it, and it's a dirty one. But anyway, it, it, it sort of qualifies. Now, how much autonomy do you need to add, so to speak, to make something an illegal weapon? That's probably going to be really, really hard to specify. But again, that doesn't mean that, you, that it's impossible to specify. Right? It might be, uh, it's often difficult to draw lines on, on certain things. And then sometimes we draw arbitrary lines and we say, if you're 18 year old, years old, you're an adult, right? We know that that's an arbitrary line, but it's, it's a useful line. So uh, I think that's a very, very important question. And the real question, therefore, is, do we want that ban? Right? I think that's the question. OK, thank you. I agree. Thank you. The, the experience, I should say the experience with presenting this kind of talk, I've done this uh, twice so far, is uh, that I have to shield for tomatoes and eggs being thrown. Right? That, that's usually what happens, that uh, uh, there's a fair amount of resistance to this kind of talk. And that's exactly the reason why we thought it might be useful to actually take that line. So if, uh, if you look at the discussion on, on killer robots, um, 90, 95% of the people who are talking about them want to ban them. That's the standard discussion, right? Um, I, I think the discussion for you uh, in this audience here is how do you see your, your role in this? Because it's very clear, I think, that, that the kinds of systems we're talking about here with increased autonomy are the systems that the military is using and will be using in the future. Um, and this is just a lot more obvious in the US where research is a lot more intimately related with the military. Uh, but that is actually the case. And you might not want it or like it, but that is happening. So you should think about whether you want that to happen with your research. Uh, even soft robotics, with Fabio talked about, I guess, is is going to be useful in some ways. And certainly, uh, for example, orientation in uh, unstructured environments. You know, that's, uh, the military wants that, right? Autonomous driving was driven by the DARPA challenge, right? DARPA is the Defense Advanced Research uh, Agency. So that's no, the bad I, news. No, I agree with you because uh, may sometimes uh, I think that some analysts is uh, overrating the level that we have already reached uh, with artificial intelligence and robotics, but uh, it's true that it's a situation very similar to the nuclear physics uh, in the 30s. So actually, the, the kind of, uh, I, the, of science uh, and application that we are working on are potentially, uh, I mean, really arise this kind of issue, so they can be used for by the military for any kind of uh, evil purpose or for defense, actually. Yeah, yeah evil or good purpose, but in, it's in any case, it, and that's not just, I think it's not a future thing, that is, is happening now, right? Yeah, so the, yeah, yeah. The, the autonomous vehicle story, for example, is very important for the military, and they are using unmanned uh, vehicles now to transport goods from A to B, because it's safer. If you don't put a soldier in there, OK, it blows up, it blows up. Nobody gets killed. That's safer. So they, they are using this kind of systems already. Uh, and uh, you know, we've all seen, for example, the big dog uh, system and other systems that do running and walking. There are military systems, right? So they, the kind of stuff that, that the um, Horizon 2020 is talking about now a lot, taking things to market and, and producing 
end users and so on in, in the US and in other places, this is the military. They are the end users. And so that, that's already happening. No, I agree with you. So, um, if, uh, that's why I think it, it's uh, very useful that we, at least we hear your opinion. And it's true that it is, uh, the first reaction could be really, let's ban those robots. But uh, I, I really, I, I, I'm not uh, throwing to you rotten tomatoes because uh, I more or less agree with you. <laughs> Uh, on both things, but we, we, we need to care about it and uh, that uh, the robots are not really going to change the full picture. Uh, I, I, I don't want to seem too much idealistic, but maybe it's time that we work not on the kind of weapons that we use in war, but how to really reduce uh, the probability of a war. No? So because someone says, and I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Uh, this could be something that you can tell us. You know that there are some, uh, histor well, I don't know, histor historians, sociologists saying that uh, actually the level of conflict and violence on this planet is going down because actually we have, uh, in this moment, we have many local conflicts. No? Um, probably the way to go is that, no? the perpetual, uh, uh, peace uh, uh, dreamed by another German, no? I mean Kant. <laughs> the Germans are sometimes uh, uh, taking an example for the World War II you told. But actually the, the first people to talk about how to build the mechanism for a t perpetual peace was actually your uh, fellow national Kant. No? I don't know what yes, you think. I, I really think that we should think of it seriously about enforcing peace, so to develop mechanisms, because I think technology is going too fast. But I don't know what I, you think about this. I, I agree I agree with that. Now, uh, talking about Kant, of course, that's clearly a case of the uh, dwarfs on the shoulder of the giant, right? I mean, I'm a sort of like a mosquito on the shoulder of the giant in this case. Um, I. I Yes, we are seeing a, an overall reduction in the numbers of people being killed and maimed and so on in wars, for example, in the last century. That's true and it's very good news. Um, but what we are seeing primarily, I would say, is a reduction of victims of war in the rich countries. Right? So not so long ago, your country, Fabio, and mine were at war. Uh, yeah. And that now seems like a crazy idea, right? So, uh, but more or less, your country and mine are at war in Syria now in some ways. So, and, and that is something that people discuss. Now, these are the poor people that more or less, and they share the, they get the burden of the, of the situation. So I. I do not see any kind of world order that seriously um, goes towards some kind of eternal peace. What I see is significant uh, political pressure to keeping the wars outside of certain places. Right? The, the U.S. is spending uh, around 40 percent of the world military budget. Right? It's outspending the next uh, spender, which I think is China. Uh, by by a factor of three, so uh, that's the fight that's going on. It seems to me. And uh, one of the interesting questions is whether the weapons that we're talking about will actually lead to more conflicts of this asymmetric sort, right? And make it easier for a, a big country like China or the U.S. or Japan uh, to invade a small country because you will have no body bags coming back, right? You'll be safer. So we might have more wars in that way. That's the worry that, that one sees in this, in this context, right? And, and I think the, the, the nuclear war worry is, is still looming above us. I mean, we, that was a huge issue when I was in high school or in something we were because we thought the nuclear war is going to happen where we are sitting, right? So it's going to come from this side and the other side and it's going to happen here. Um, the, war, the weapons are still there. 
So it's not that uh, that's uh, we're beyond that that stage in any case. But in any way, I, I, I was hoping that I might sort of um, get people worried a little bit about this issue. Um, and uh, I think it is really important for researchers, as, as Fabio says, to think about the impact of their work. And we have very nice tumor robots and other neat things in our labs, but uh, everybody knows that the ICAB, which looks really cute and runs around in Plymouth, uh, can be, in other places, can be refitted and, and its stuff can be used for other purposes. And that's, in fact, in some cases, that's the reason why these things do get funded. So we are responsible for that to some extent. Responsibility was, of course, a major issue in my debate. So it's, it's not an on-off thing. You are responsible to some extent, but you, we are all responsible for our actions. So I'm responsible for going around and saying, maybe this is a good idea. And that is something that I'm worried about. Because some years down the line, some people will come to me and say, Vincent, weren't you the guy who said in 2014 or so that this might be a good idea? Look what happened. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Herbert. <laughs>